Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Schuhart, and I am a volunteer with Madison Audubon. Um, I'm also an avid birder um, and really love to be out exploring all the wonderful green spaces we have around the Madison area um, and looking for birds. Wisconsin sees over 300 different species of birds throughout the year. Um, that's birds that are um, that may be breeding and nesting here, and that's also birds that are traveling through Wisconsin on their migratory journeys. Um, so we have this huge amount of variety, and a lot of it's variety that you can find right in your backyard. You don't have to be traveling to far off destinations to be seeing some really amazing, really cool birds. Um, we can find them right here in town. Um, and, if, and of course, you can drive a little further if you want. I'll talk about some local destinations and some destinations that make really great day trips um, near the end of the presentation tonight. But the bulk of what we're going to be doing is basically looking at the wide variety of species that we can find here in Wisconsin. So I'm going to start us off by going through basically a bunch of birds. Am I going to talk about each and every bird? No, I have a ton of pictures to show you. We'll talk about these broad groups of birds, but there's no way that I can cover 300 birds, birds tonight. So we'll talk about um, some key ones that will be easy for you guys to find um, and will be really kind of exciting um, to, to look forward to this spring and summer. Um, we'll talk a little bit about getting started with birding, um, which is a really fun, really, really rewarding hobby um, that you can start very easily. Um, and then we'll talk about some of those recommended destinations. So um, I'm just going to go, we're going to jump right in and talk about, uh, let's see, where's my mouse here? Um, we're going to talk about some of the different habitats that you can find birds in. So instead of just talking about all these birds as a whole, what I've done here is I've broken down the different species you can find based on the different habitat that you go to. So we're going to talk about birds you can find at the marsh. We're going to talk about birds you can find at the, on the prairie. We'll talk about birds you can find in the woods and then birds you can find at your feeders. As I'm going through these, these, all these birds, if you have questions on them, if, you, if there's something you want to learn more about, um, please put your comments in, um, in the chat box. At the end of the presentation, um, we'll go through and we'll talk about some of those, um, some of your questions and we can, um, we can answer those at the end. So let's get started by looking at the birds of the marsh. Um, and I'm going to be honest, I started with the marsh because marshes are one of my favorite, favorite, favorite places to go birding. Um, there are so many hidden treasures that you can find in a marsh, um, from wading birds to shore birds to the super secretive marsh birds. Um, marshes really just like come alive with activity. Um, in late April and early May, they are like the place that you want to be. Um, so um, I've kind of gr grouped the birds that you might find in marshy habitats um, into a couple different slides here. Um, the first is about herons and egrets. A lot of you might recognize great blue herons. Um, they're pretty common around the Madison area um, and you might even find them on local ponds um, in your neighborhood. Um, green herons are much smaller than great blue herons and then they're, they're a lot more secretive, um, but they're really fun to find. Uh, you can look for them kind of creeping along um, the edges of cattails where they might be kind of hiding at the edge of the water, stalking prey um, as they kind of walk along the shore. Um, a great egret, the last bird over here, um, are another wading bird that you might see standing in the water as they forage and pick out minnows and frogs and things that are living in the water. Um, I put another bird on here um, that you might not that you might not see because they're super camouflaged and kind of hard to find. Um, called the American bittern. Bitterns are um, they're very well camo camouflaged, and they're one of, actually one of my favorite birds just because of how unique they are and how they choose to camouflage themselves. Um, you can see on their neck they have these these very stripy um, kind of like streaks that come down their front. Um, and when they feel like there's a threat or there's something that they want to hide from, they'll stick their head straight up and their neck straight up. And so the streaks on their front cause them to blend right in with the cattails. It's super smart and they look super goofy when they do it. Um, and it's really neat. Um, you might not see an American bittern um, in our area. If you go to somewhere like Horicon Marsh, um, that's a really good place to be finding them. 
Um, and if you go out really early in the morning or like right at dawn or, or late in the evening at dusk, you might actually hear one, especially during May, um, which is their breeding season. I'm gonna play um, the, the call of the American bittern because um, some people might, you might hear it and you might not even think of it as a bird. Um, it's a really unique sound. Um, and let me know if you just wanna raise your hand when I play this to make sure that, you, that you're hearing it. Can you hear that? It, it almost sounds like water being pumped out of a, out of a well. Um, it's a super unique noise. Um, so that's the call of the American bittern, if you ever are lucky enough to hear to hear that noise. Next up, we have cranes. You guys, you, you've all seen sandhill cranes. Um, they're all around town. Um, whooping cranes um, are another um, species of crane that we can find here in Wisconsin that are endangered. Um, they have a very limited population, um, but they do come back to Wisconsin to breed. Um, so if you're out, um, it, especially near Horicon Marsh, which is another destination we'll talk about later, um, keep your eyes peeled for, for some spots of white um, out in the marsh. It, it could be a whooping crane. Um, and you'll notice they have um, this red patterning on their head, and they're a little bit larger than a sandhill crane. During migration, they sometimes hang out with sandhills. Um, so if you look at a flock and see a white bird among them, um, that could be a whooping crane. Um, other birds that you can see in marshes or um, along um, spots of open water like lakes and such would be American white pelicans and double crested cormorants. These are both fish loving birds. Um, pelicans, I actually just saw some of these today on the Lower Yahara River Trail um, down by Lake Farm County Park. There's a big flock of them. Um, they love to gather in large groups um, and cormorants often do as well. You might see cormorants in the water, um, sitting really low with their long necks kind of poking out. Um, they're excellent divers and they dive very far below the water as they look for fish. Um, so they, they like fish, pelicans like fish, and I think that's why they like, they like to be friends. They hang out a lot. Up next, we have two different types of rails, which are very, very secretive marsh birds. Um, they look kind of large in these photos just because they're they're all by themselves, but they're actually very small. We're talking just like maybe like this big. Um, and you might not see them at the marsh, but you might hear them. They're actually very, they're pretty common um, and you might recognize some of their noises. I'm going to play um, a couple different noises that um, that they make. And I'm going to start with the Sora since I think you might recognize that. Um, they have like this whinny call um, that kind of makes this descending noise, almost like a ball that's dropping. We'll listen to it here. Oh, actually, that's not what I meant to do. I... I'm going to play that one more time for you to hear it. That's, so that's one noise they make. They also make a different type of call that, see if I can get this one to play. Sounds like purr wee, purr wee, purr wee. And then rails make some, uh, some pretty strange noises that kind of sound like grunts almost. Let's listen to one of them. Kind of like a laughing kind of grunt. Um, so you might hear you might hear that out in the marsh, um, and they also make a call that's called a kadik call. It goes kadik 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 kadik, and it gets faster as it goes. Um, let's listen to that one quick. Um, so those are two, or actually well, four different types of noises um, of two very elusive birds that are common in marshes, but not commonly seen. They're so tiny and they just hide in the reeds, but they're down there. Um, and if you if you go to a marsh um, and you just, you listen and you, and you wait and you're really patient and really quiet, um, these are noises that you might hear. Um, other birds that you can see in marshes are some shorebirds. Wisconsin sees a lot of different types of shorebirds, but I only included three of the most common ones that you're likely to see kind of poking around in the mud or the shallow water um, if you're at a marsh. 
and that would be the Wilson snipe with its really long bill, the spotted sandpiper um, with these spots on the front of its chest, um, and then the solitary sandpiper um, that has um, that looks kind of like the spotted sandpiper, but I like to tell them apart by how the spotted sandpiper will bob its tail when it walks. So if you see a, a spotted sandpiper moving around, it's just gonna be like bopping up and down constantly. So if you see a shorebird that's, that's just kind of like bobbing its tail the whole time, you're probably looking at a spotted sandpiper. Uh, there's a lot of songbirds that you can find in the marsh as well. Um, we have here a marsh wren, a sedge wren, a swamp sparrow, common yellow throat, which is a type of warbler, yellow-headed blackbird, which is pretty uncommon, but you can definitely find it here in Dane County, um, specifically um, if you head up to um, the Vienna Waterfowl Production Area. It's this big marshy area off of, highway, of, of County Road V. You can pull your car off onto the side of the road on, on, on the highway or on um, Patton, um, which is a road that intersects there, and you can actually listen for yellow-headed blackbirds and look for them um, in the reeds. Um, they have a very, very, I didn't put their call on here, but they make a very interesting call that makes you wonder what exactly they're doing. It's very hoarse. Um, it sounds like a kind of like a red winged blackbird um, that maybe has an extremely sore throat. Um, and you might recognize red winged blackbirds. They're very loud and territorial this time of year as we get into breeding season. Marshes also have lots and lots of waterfowl. I'm not going to talk about all these different types of ducks, but in particular, you should be looking for green winged teal and blue winged teal and northern shovelers right now. I would say that those species are kind of the ones that I tend to see the most often in marshes. Um, they're dabbling ducks um, that you can often find close to close to the edge of the water um, when they they're foraging for food um, on the surface and kind of filtering it out with their bills. So we're not going to talk about a lot of ducks um, right now just because there's so many of them, um, but you can see an immense variety, a lot more than just mallards, um, if you kind of stop and pay attention to all of the different diverse characteristics that they have. Um, if you're hanging out around bodies of water, um, whether it's marshes or lakes, um, you might find some raptors. Um, I included a northern harrier on here because they love marshes. Um, you might find them flying very low um, over marshy areas. Um, they're a raptor that has a very unique facial structure. You can kind of see that they have this, almost this ring or this facial disc um, around their head that helps improve their hearing so they can better hear their prey. And then I included a picture of an osprey um, because they are birds that um, that love to eat fish. Um, so you might find them net like building their nests on top of cell to cell phone towers um, or, or other platforms that are near bodies of water. Um, and you might even see them in flight with a fish. Um, they, they carry the fish um, parallel um, to their body to be a little more aerodynamic. Um, other birds can't do that because they have different Osprey actually have a special type of like foot pattern um, that allows them to carry those fish like that because um, they've really adapted to eating them. And then it kind of wrapped that wrapped up our marshy bird <laughs> section. Um, that was a lot of birds, um, but I think that should hopefully convince you that marshes are probably the one of the first places you should go if you're looking to get started with birding this summer. Um, and my recommendation is to be patient, be quiet be quiet um, and to listen really carefully to see if you can hear the sounds of some of those very secretive marsh birds. Um, up next, we're gonna look at some birds that you can find on the prairie. If you are out walking prairie trails this summer or out kind of like looking at wildflowers, you might see a lot of birds pop up um, and say hello along the way. Um, so Wisconsin um, is home to a bunch of different types of grassland birds, um, which are species that are gonna nest, um, be nesting in our prairies. Um, in particular, we have the bobolink, um, dick sisal, and eastern meadowlark um, that I put on here. Um, and I put also a picture of this gorgeous prairie, um, Shirk Thompson Prairie, um, which is out west of town. Um, that's a really great spot to go looking for birds. Um, these, you'll notice that grassland birds too, a lot of them are pictured singing because they, they, they do a lot of singing in the summer. Um, so even if you don't spot them, you, you'll probably hear all of their songs that they're belting out across the prairie. 
I also included a bunch of different sparrows. Um, sparrows can be a little difficult for beginning birders um, because you'll notice that they all kind of look a little bit brown and they all kind of look a little bit streaky. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about having to ID each and every one of these species. Um, I have on here song sparrow, field sparrow, um, chipping sparrow, clay colored sparrow, and Henslow sparrow. The top three on here are sparrows that you can find in a lot of places around town. Um, the bottom two are ones that you are probably only going to find if you're actually out on uh, some restored prairie habitat. Um, but they are um, they're really fun um, to, to try and get good looks at. They can be challenging because they like to hide though. Um, so sparrows are, are equal parts fun and frustrating, um, but you should know that they, um, amongst all the prairie birds out there, you got a lot of sparrows flitting around too. Um, you can see some more raptors if you're out in the country um, when you're out kind of on prairie type habitats. Um, you've got a nice red-tailed hawk here that, that had flown down to grab some prey. Um, I have another picture of a northern harrier. Um, this time this is a female northern harrier um, perched and you can really see that unique facial structure. Harriers um, will fly over marshes and over prairies um, and they, they prefer to nest in those types of habitats as well on the ground. Um, and um, they, they're, if you see a bird that's flying very low to the ground, um, especially at in the early morning or in the evening, um, that might be a harrier. And then I have our smallest falcon over here, our American kestrel, um, that you might find perched up on a wire um, along along a hut, along the road um, or on a fence post. Um, they like to kind of like pick a perch um, and then they'll listen and look for their prey and then they'll go and they'll dive for them. They also hover in midair, um, and you, so you might see them doing that kiting behavior as well, where they kind of they hover above the spot where they think their prey is, and then they'll dive down and grab them. Very cool little birds, very small little birds. Kestrels are tiny, but they're very fierce. Um, this is we've kind of got an odd an odd bird out. Um, this is a shorebird um, called an American woodcock. It's in the sandpiper family, like those other shorebirds that we saw in the marsh. But short, American woodcocks don't usually end up at marshes. They end up on prairies. Um, they're birds that nest in woodlands. Um, so they nest in forested, wooded areas. But they perform their mating rituals out on open fields um, and prairies that are near those woods. Um, now, like right now, um, as it even right now as it's getting darker, um, is the time to be listening and looking for American woodcocks. Um, they start performing what's called their sky dance um, in um, late March and early April. They'll keep doing it probably for the rest of the month. Um, and they make I should have put a noise, I should have put their noise on here. I don't I I forgot to put their call on here, so I'm gonna have to imitate it for you. Um, they make a noise, it's called a peent. Um, it sounds like peep, 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 peep. And they will, and they just, they just do that endlessly. Um, and while they're doing that, they're on the ground um, painting. And then suddenly they'll burst up off the ground. They'll fly up into the air. They'll, they'll, they'll fly super, super high in this big, massive spiral as they make these twittery noises with their wings. They'll, get to the top of their spiral, which is like way, way up, almost out of sight. They're just a speck in the sky at this point. They'll make this twittering noise and then they'll fly straight back down to the same spot that they flew up from. And then, peep, 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 and they do it all over again. Um, it's a, it is a wonderful experience to watch an American woodcock um, kind of do its performance. You might not get great looks at them on the ground, but you'll see them as they're in flight. And they're they're tiny birds too. Um, so they're you can see they're very plump. <laughs> um, they have these long bills and they kind of have these short wings. So when you see them in flight, they honestly look like they're little fat hummingbirds um, with their long bill and their wings. It's they're they're comical in a lot of different aspects. Um, they're also just really lovable. So. Um, you should head to a prairie near a wooded area. I highly recommend Curtis Prairie um, on, at the UW Arboretum um, or the prairie out um, at Pheasant Branch Conservancy. Um, 
or Governor Nelson State Park, um, the prairies there, those are all really good spots to be look, looking and listening for American woodcocks. Okay, now we're heading into the woods um, where we have warblers, vireos, flycatchers, thrushes, and more. Woods, the woods come alive with color in spring. Um, and there's a lot of birds we can see here. We're gonna go through some of these really fast just for the sake of time. Um, but I want you to just see this massive rainbow of colors that you can witness um, during spring migration when you're in the woods. Um, I've included a ton of warblers on this slide, but this is only a small selection of the 30 plus species of warblers that you can find in Wisconsin. Um, so I'll let you look at the names in the photos here, but you should just be aware that there is so much color um, and that these little birds are just <laughs> little, little like vibrant balls of, of sunshine that just like bop around probably faster than you can get your eyes on them. Um, Warbler, warblers um, will start showing up in May. So we might have a couple that show up um, in April, but May is when warblers get like crazy. And in order to, if you want your best warbler experience, I would recommend, um, unfortunately, getting up a little bit early um, to go and visit some wooded areas um, that have that kind of border open areas um, that will get hit by the morning sun. Um, and so what the, the best spots I found are um, at places like whether it's um, Cher Cherokee Marsh or Lake Kaganza State Park or the Arboretum where you have wooded, uh, lots of mixed habitat um, with lots of trees, um, but those trees that get really good sunlight in the morning, um, when you get there in the morning, the sun will have just started to warm up the bugs in the, in the trees. And when the bugs wake up, the warblers wake up. So because warblers are insect eating birds. And so they've been traveling on their migratory journey and they're super, super hungry and they need to refuel before they can keep traveling. And so they will, um, they'll be going crazy for bugs right away in the morning when all the bugs are kind of starting to wake up as, as, they've, been, as they've been warmed by the sun. So mornings are a really good time for warblers if you want to see lots of them. That doesn't mean that you can't find them throughout the rest of the day, because um, you absolutely can. Um, you can find them later in the evening as well. But for the most variety and for the for a really kind of experience of being just surrounded by um, lots of active birds, um, morning is a good spot for warblers. But um, there's we're not going to talk about about all of these, but I just want you to know that. Um, there's a huge amount of variety. You can see a lot of really unique birds. Um, there's male and they get tricky though, because I've included a lot of photos of male warblers on here, but female warblers um, can look a little bit slightly different um, for each of these species. So don't be intimidated by them. Um, just go out there and see if you can find a warbler, any warbler, and then maybe figure out what it is. Um, who know, who cares if you're right or not? Um, it's just, it's really fun to just go through that process of being like, I found this bird and let me investigate what, which one it is. I'll show you guys a really great app um, that can help you with some of your bird ID later in the presentation. Um, among all our warblers, um, you might find um, some birds that are called vireos. Um, I included three on here, the red-eyed vireo, the warbling vireo, and the yellow-throated vireo. They're a similar size to warblers, but you can see that their bills are a little bit thicker, a little bit bigger. Um, they, for, they also like to eat insects, so they'll be mixed in um, with warbler flocks sometimes when you're looking at them. Um, and it can be honestly a kind of hard to tell them apart, um, but I would really look at their, at their bill um, and pay attention to how they forage a little bit slower um, than those warblers that will kind of be popping around really, really fast. Vireos are a little more methodical um, in how they move about through the trees. Kinglets, however, uh, these, these guys are just like little balls of energy. Um, right now is actually a really great time to see golden crown kinglets with their nice gold mohawks um, and ruby crown kinglets with their little red mohawks. Ruby crown kinglets don't always show this red on their head. Sometimes they just look completely brown. Um, but golden crown kinglets, you can usually get that nice yellow stripe straight down their head. Um, kinglets are very, very tiny, very active birds um, that will 
we'll act, you might actually even see them hovering in midair, kind of like hummingbirds do, but um, but not as as intense as a hummingbird. Um, they're they are also um, foraging for insects and will hang out with mixed flocks of warblers as well. On our next slide here, um, we've got flycatchers. Um, flycatchers are notoriously hard to identify. Um, I don't think we need to talk about how to start identifying them, but the thing I want you to know is that is something about their behavior. So most of our, our flycatcher species here, they'll pick a spot to perch, whether it's on an open branch or like the top of a branch or on a, some, some wire like the Eastern Kingbird. Um, they'll pick a spot to kind of like stake out their spot and then they'll if they see a bug that they want in the air they'll fly out and they'll grab it and then they'll fly back to that spot um, and so birds like the eastern phoebe that you see on top here um, will do this all the time when they when they're sitting they might bob their tails a bit so you and that sets them apart from some other flycatchers but all of these species um, they'll perch somewhere they'll zoom out and they'll grab a they'll grab a fly. I don't know if it's a fly. It could be a, some other type of bug. Um, and then they'll they'll return to that spot. Um, so that's kind of just what they do is that they're flycatchers. They, they sit, they wait, they whoop, I'm gonna go grab that. Then they come back. And so if you see this bird that's constantly returning to the same area after flying out and snatching something and it's come back and sit, fly out and snatch something, come back and sit, that's probably a type of flycatcher. Um, up next, we have thrushes. Um, so wood thrush, hermit thrush, Swainson's thrush. Um, these also can be kind of tricky to ID, but you'll notice that instead of being high up in the trees, like all the other birds that we've seen, these birds will be down low to the ground, um, kind of kicking, digging around in the, on the forest floor, kicking up leaves. Um, they're usually gonna be kind of skulky, hiding low instead of being way up high in the trees. Um, so if if you see a bird that is, oh, pardon my pardon my cat, this is my cat Sage. He's making his Zoom debut. Um, he's an indoor cat too, um, just because that is something that helps protect birds. Um, so we were talking about thrushes here. Um, they're very brown, kind of very very spotted, um, low to the ground, hiding in that brush can be challenging to get good looks at, but if you see something kind of moving around on the forest floor, you should keep an eye out for them. Um, up next, woodpeckers. Um, these are species that um, we have had here. We, we have woodpeckers here year round. Um, I think the red-headed woodpecker isn't always here year round and will be one a species that shows up in the spring and the summer, and they can be really fun to look for. Um, I know out at Indian Lake County Park, um, that can be a really good spot to go look for red-headed woodpeckers. Um, Cherokee South, the south unit of Cherokee Marsh, also a really good spot to look for red-headed woodpeckers. They like um, places where there are dead trees where they can build their, their nest cavities. Live trees, no, they need some dead trees. Um, so if there's no dead trees around in that habitat, that's, that's not gonna be a good place for them to nest and so you won't find them there. But you should keep, keep an eye out for all of these different woodpeckers um, in the woods um, this spring and summer. Um, and um, if, you're, if you look carefully, um, you should also keep an eye out for owls um, and owlets. Um, owls actually start mating and, and having um, and doing their courtship um, behaviors way back like in early or late fall and early winter. Um, so by the time that spring rolls around, they already have young, whereas other bird species are only just starting the nesting process. So I included, so here's some photos here of um, some young um, great horned owls, or a, a young great horned owl, and then some young barred owls. Um, and you can see how they look a lot fuzzier um, and a little more like floofy and unkempt than, than, your, um, than your adult owls. Um, but you might hear them uh, making their begging calls um, in the spring and summer. Um, and if you listen to, a, if you Google great horned owl begging calls, you might be a little disturbed. They sound pretty much, they sound really kind of crazy. Um, and if you don't know what type of noise that is, um, when you're hearing it, you can be like, oh gosh, what, what's happening? Is that someone yelling? Is that someone screaming? It's just great horned owls, baby great horned owls wanting to be fed. 
Um, so you might hear that in, even in your neighborhood, um, you'd be surprised at how many nests are actually in suburban areas. Um, so when you're out in the woods, um, you might be able to keep to get your eyes on some young owls as well. Uh, once they start branching, um, which means that that they have left the nest, um, they'll actually start climbing around in the trees a lot and can be, depending on if there's a nest around, um, you might be able to get good looks at them. Um, up next, we have birds that you might find at your feeders. Um, so the birds that are on these, this next slide aren't necessarily um, birds that are exclusively at your feeders. You might find them in the woods, you might find them on the prairie, you might find them um, elsewhere as well. But they are ones that you're likely to see um, if you do have feeders out um, or even if you're in an apart in apartment um, in your apartment complex area. I don't have any feeders because I live in an apartment, but I still get a chance to see a lot of these birds. Um, even in my very parking, it's almost like a parking parking lot. There's a couple trees and some green space. Um, and even there, I can find some of these birds, which is really cool. Um, so you might recognize a lot of these. Northern Cardinals, Blue Jays, Chickadees, House Finches, um, Tufted Titmice, um, American Goldfinch, um, Common Grackle, Baltimore Oriole. I know those are a favorite. Um, they'll start showing up around Mother's Day. Um, so if you are someone that likes to put out oranges for them, that's a good time to start. And then House Wren, um, little tiny house wrens that like to be, um, I don't know if you've ever had one nest anywhere near your home, but they like to scold you a lot if you get too close. And that actually <laughs> wrapped up our very, very fast overview of the wide variety of birds that you can find in southern Wisconsin during the spring and summer. I did leave a lot of species off this list, um, and I was having to be very selective when I, when I put it together because I still wanted us to have time to talk about all the places you can go, how to get started with birding, and to leave room for questions. Um, so if you're like, oh man, she missed tree swallows. Why didn't she talk about tree swallows? It's because I just, I didn't have, <laughs> I forgot to put them on here. Um, but you'll see tree swallows, you'll see barn swallows, um, you'll see a lot of small birds that spend a lot of time in the air, um, especially as, as they're um, looking, for, looking for bugs. Um, but yeah, it's our next section here, we're gonna move on to talking about how you can get, start, get started with birding. And I realize now I'm looking at this slide um, and I have a winter scene on here. Um, and that's because I was updating I with when I did this presentation with Middle, the Middleton Public Library for fall and winter, I'm kind of adapting the, an old PowerPoint. And this is one of the winter scenes that I had on there. So, but who knows, maybe it's possible that we might get snow yet again, but I don't think that'll happen. Um, but it would not be unheard of. That's, Wisconsin for you. So if you are wondering how how do I get started with birding? How do I get out there and start looking for these birds? Um, my answer is is honestly pretty simple. It's just to pick a place, go out there, and you don't even have to have binoculars, but just start paying attention. Be be quiet, listen to the sounds around you, start to notice when you see things that are moving. Um, and pay attention to the smallest shifts in, in the world around you. Um, and you will start to notice, oh, there's a bird that flew out over there. And then you'll, you'll start to be able to maybe follow it with your eyes. Um, maybe you'll get a good look at what color it was and you can start to piece together what maybe, maybe what it might be. Um, it doesn't take a lot of effort. It doesn't take a lot of equipment. It doesn't take a lot of time to get started with birding. Um, you can do it anywhere. You it, whether it's in your backyard, whether you're out on a walk, it's a matter of shifting your attention to the world around you and really thinking about um, the, that, you know, th that movement and those sounds and kind of stepping into a different world where you start to see all of that stuff around you because birds are everywhere. We've, we've just looked at all the different places that birds can be and they're all over. Um, and so it's a matter of just kind of of turning your turning your mind to them and really focusing on them. But you might want some binoculars and you might want a field guide. Um, that said, you don't need those things to get started with this hobby. Um, if you are interested in a field guide, um, I would recommend that you start with one that is specifically an Eastern guide. 
you'll notice that bird guides have Eastern guides and Western guides. And then there's just like birds of North America. Um, Eastern guides are going to show you birds that are on the Eastern part, like basically East of the Rockies, um, which is, which is our region. Um, and they're going to narrow down dramatically the number of birds that you might find um, that are here in Wisconsin. If you pick a Western guide, you're going to be looking at species that are found on the opposite side of the country. And if you pick a birds of North America guide, you're going to be looking at all the birds of North America, not necessarily the ones that you're more likely to find in Wisconsin. Um, I have a link on here um, to, uh, got to a place that goes through, looks at a bunch of different um, free and um, guides for purchasing um, to give you an idea of the wide variety of guides that are out there. I'm going to put a copy of tonight's presentation in the chat box at the end of the evening so you can download that then and then you can go click on these links. Um, binoculars are also helpful, um, but there you can get by without them. Um, if you have a camera um, a, with, a, with a decent zoom lens, um, you, can, you can use that as, as kind of like working with your binoculars um and taking start taking photos of birds um and you can also just use your eyes and your ears um there's a lot that you can learn about birds um and bird behavior and just kind of getting attuned to that world of birds just going out with your eyes and ears alone however if you do want some binoculars there's a lot of affordable options um that you can choose from i definitely got sticker shock when i looked at the price of binoculars um, when I wanted to buy some, um, they can get really expensive really fast, but you don't need to, to get the most expensive pair in order to get that close look at birds you want. Um, my first pair um, was the Nikon Pro Staff 3S. They were just over a hundred dollars um, and they were what they were the kind of the one of the options on the link in this article that I'll share with you. And they were, they're amazing um, for their price point. They're a really, really quality pair of binoculars. So there's a lot of options out there, but that said, if they're out of your reach right now, that's okay because you don't necessarily need them. Um, now, when it comes to bird ID, um, like, like we mentioned, there's like 300 some birds in Wisconsin and that's a lot of birds. Um, Maryland bird ID can help you dramatically narrow down what you might have seen. It asks you five questions. Where did you see the bird? When did you see it? What size was it? What were the primary colors? What was it doing? You, it, if you're using the app on your phone, the where, where you saw it and when you saw it, all of that stuff is auto-populated based on your location and the date that you're looking up the bird. And you just have to answer three questions. It pops back a list of the most common options um, that you might be seeing based on what you entered. And then you can be like, oh, Heck, yeah, that's my bird. Um, or maybe you were close, um, or, in, or maybe Merlin was close, and it was like one, the third suggestion. Sometimes that happens. Um, this is a completely free app for your phone that works as um, it helps you ID birds. It, you can upload a photo of a bird you've taken, and it will pop out an ID for you. And it also functions as just a field guide for your phone. So you can go through and browse birds. You can read about them. You can look at their pictures, you can listen to their calls. All of that is in this free app. I highly, highly recommend it if you're getting started with birding. Um, it's a game changer. Um, I've also linked some resources for new birders on here. Um, the first is the Entryway to Birding blog um, on the Madison Audubon website. I don't know if you have seen it before or followed it, but um, I wrote this blog, so I, um, I'm, I'm partial to it, but it really is, um, it's a full year of content um, that walks you through um, getting started with birding. So I started the blog last March, um, right when the pandemic was getting going, and you can start reading from the beginning and you can basically slowly accumulate a lot of the skills that you need um, to get really interested in birding as a hobby. Um, so there's a wide variety of subjects that I cover. Um, they're all split up by seasons. Um, and it's a really great resource if you're looking for local specific suggestions on places to go and things to see in our area. If you're on Facebook, there's some really cool Facebook groups you can join, um, like Birding Wisconsin or What's This Bird if you need some bird ID help. Um, and then there's also the DNR statewide birding report that you can subscribe to um, so you can get weekly updates on what's happening in the bird world in Wisconsin. 
Um, and it kind of helps you know like, oh, I should be looking out for warblers because they'll be showing up soon. Um, so highly recommend signing up for those reports as well. And you, you'll get a copy of all these links in the PowerPoint at the end of the presentation. Next, um, we're going to talk about destinations. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Madison Audubon's amazing sanctuaries. Um, there's Goose Pond Sanctuary, Otsego Marsh, and then Fayville Grove Sanctuary. Goose Pond, of course, has this massive, amazing pond that's filled with waterfowl and shorebirds, but there are trails upon trails upon trails that go through gorgeous restored prairies where you can get your grassland birds and all your marsh birds. Um, so that's a really fun destination. Uh, Seagull Marsh um, has woodland trails. It has the all this marshy habitat um, and is another really great spot for some um, to get both of those groups. And then Fayville Grove Sanctuary um, has, again, lots and lots of prairie trails. There's, there's a really lovely marsh. Um, there's some wooded areas as well. These are great places where you can get a lot of mixed habitat and see lots and lots of birds. Um, other destinations um, that are within about maybe an hour to a two hour drive um, that I think are kind of like must visits um, for folks that like birding in Wisconsin. Um, first of all is Horicon Marsh. Um, this is where you get all of your marsh birds, you guys. You can get, this is where I saw my first American bittern and it was amazing. You can also see um, here in the picture, um, I took this photo of a black neck stilt um, that I saw out there. So you can get some really unique, cool looking shorebirds that you can't find anywhere else in the state. Um, there's her herons, there's egrets, trumpeter swans, black crowned night herons, a lot of marsh birds that I didn't even have time to talk about earlier in the presentation. You can find them at Horicon Marsh. I marked some key spots on here. Um, the auto tour route is really fun to drive. There's a spot where you can pop off and walk around on a boardwalk. Old Marsh Road um, is a fun road to walk. Um, and then Ledge Road is a road you can drive down um, and kind of like see a ton, just a ton of activity even on that short drive. Um, another destination um, is Spring Green Preserve, um, which some folks have kind of nicknamed Wisconsin's Desert. Um, this is over in Sauk County um, near Spring Green, um, and it is a really unique habitat that's very dry and desert-like. Uh, I think it's the one spot in Wisconsin where you can find cacti um, and um, just lots of really cool birds, um, including lark sparrows, which are an kind of an uncommon declining species. You can see a picture of them here in the photo um, and lots of other unique birds that show up there as well. And then Wyalusing State Park. Um, if you're a warbler fan, um, this is a fun destination because at Wyalusing State Park, which is this park, beautiful state park that overlooks um, the confluence of the Mississippi and the Wisconsin rivers, um, there's a lot of um, warblers that breed at Wyalusing State Park, like Kentucky warblers, um, which are very rare in Wisconsin, and then Cerulean warblers as well, um, like the one in that photo. Um, so lots of warblers um, at Wyalusing State Park. So there's a marshy spot you can go to, there's a grassland spot you can go to, and then there's a warble, very warbler focused spot you can go to. Um, but if you wanna st stick around close to the Madison area or the Middleton area, um, I put a list of popular birding hotspots um, around town um, that I think would be, a, any of these would be a phenomenal place for a beginning birder to go. Um, Lake Kaganza State Park, amazing for warblers. Nine Springs, um, which is um, part of the Capital Springs Recreation Area. Um, it's that set of ponds kind of near the Sewer Ridge District. There's dikes that run around all those ponds and you can walk out there and you can see a bunch of marsh birds, you can see shorebirds, you can see waterfowl, you can see osprey that are nesting on top of the cell phone tower out there. It's a really, really great spot. Um, there's also Brooklyn Wildlife Area, which is um, further south um, near Brooklyn and Belleville um, that has, if you are looking for a, like a grassland habitat nearby, lots of sparrows and stuff that are out there. The UW Arboretum um, is a basically a little bit of everything. You got prairie, you got woods. Um, it's, it's a really awesome spot that attracts a lot of birds in the spring and summer. Same thing with Lakeshore Nature Preserve and University Bay. Um, Cherokee Marsh, the north and south units, um, are my one of my both of my 
or both really go-to spots when I want to go see warblers, I head there first. Um, Pheasant Branch is an amazing spot. There's Pheasant Branch Conservancy, but there's also Pheasant Branch Creek Corridor, those paved trails um, that run th run like right along the creek um, where you have all of that greenery and that brush kind of coming up along the paths. Warblers are, they love Pheasant Branch Creek Corridor because they have some water, they've got all this green space um, and you can get really nice close looks at them um, because the path is so close by. And then Governor Nelson State Park, another really great destination. We're so spoiled. We have so many state parks nearby. Um, so this is just a small taste of some of the many, many popular birding spots around Madison. If you go on eBird, which is a really great um, site um, that can help you discover where you can find more birds, um, you can look at a hotspot explorer that will show you all these different locations um, and where you might go. And if you're feeling up for it, you can actually start submitting your sightings to eBird um, and be part of this amazing citizen science program where birders um, like, like you, like me, um, report what we're finding so scientists can have access to all of this data about bird populations and where birds are, how, how birds are changing during migration, um, how they're um, responding to extreme weather, they use eBird data for so many things, and you can contribute to eBird if you're interested. If you need more ideas about where to go, um, you can also check out the Great Wisconsin Birding and Nature Trail. Um, this is just kind of the Dane County area and here, and you can just see all these different places you can go um, in South Central Wisconsin, like six, what, 60 some places just in this part of the state. And they have, they have additions of this for for all across the state. So this is a really great spot if you want some more specific birding destinations. And then um, if you are interested in a birding for a cause this, this spring, um, I would really encourage you to participate in um, the Great Wisconsin Birdathon. Uh, the Birdathon is our state's largest fundraiser for bird conservation. Um, and it's basically like a walkathon, but instead of logging miles that you walk, you log the number of birds that you can find. Um, you can participate on any day between April 15th and June 15th. It's totally free. Um, and what, what you do is you basically, you form a team or you join by yourself. Um, you fundraise um, for bird conservation, and then you spend a day out birding with your friends. Um, if you are part of a nonprofit organization and your nonprofit is interested in participating, nonprofits can actually keep half the funds that they raise for the Birdathon, um, and then the other half will go to the Bird Protection Fund. Um, which goes to support our state's most imperiled species like piping plovers, Kirtland's warblers, and whooping cranes, and more. Um, the Birdathon is a really, really awesome event that happens every spring, right during peak spring, peak spring migration. Um, and you can learn more about it at wibirdathon.org. And that, oh, you guys, that's, that's it. We made it through the PowerPoint. Um, that was a lot of, of, of stuff that I just threw at you. Um, but I would love to hear what people's questions are. Um, let me see if I can pull up the chat box. I saw that folks were entering stuff, but I wasn't able to see um, all of the questions. Um, OK. Can I ask a question quick? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Feel free to just okay. shout them out. Okay. Our, our house backs up to the Pheasant Branch Conservancy. And during the winter, we put feeders out in the front yard so we can see them from the front. And now we want the birds in the backyard and they don't seem to be going to the feeders. How do we oh. get to go to the feeders in the backyard? Oh, that's a really great question. And I think sometimes the answer is just, is just time. time. Um, okay. I know. Yeah, and I know sometimes even if, if you've never put up feeders before, for instance, it sometimes takes like several weeks for the birds to really notice that they're there. Um, and so if if there's an, an unexpected change where suddenly the feeders are in a different spot and they don't see that, it might just take them a little bit to find it. Well, so we've I don't got think a bird bath right there and they come and drink, but then they fly away and it's like Oh. Is right there but okay I'll just it's only been a two or three days so I'll, oh I'll... okay oh yeah you're definitely like if it had been a couple of weeks and you hadn't seen anything then I'd be concerned but two or three days you're like super early okay. on that so I would give it some more time and I guarantee that they'll start showing up okay thanks okay so let's see 
Um, Lisa really asked a couple questions here. Um, does the Merlin Bird ID app function as a log for your own bird sightings too? Um, that's a great question. Um, as soon as you pull up um, a bird on Merlin, let's say you identify it as um, like, oh, that's the species that I saw after you use the, um, the, the app, you can click on that bird and have it added to um, your eBird account um, and it will keep track of your life list for you. Um, so it absolutely does. It's paired with eBird. Um, so you can you can kind of use those in function and you can that's actually a new feature that they rolled out just this past year. So Merlin Bird ID, ID app can function as a way for you to keep track of the birds you've seen in addition to just IDing birds. So it's that's yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Um, and then uh, there was another question. Can you recommend area any areas that are particularly accessible for people with limited mobility? Um, and there. I would actually think one of the spots that I would recommend would be the Pheasant Branch Creek Corridor um, because it has paved trails um, and those paved and those trails are relatively flat. Um, and so that the, the only caveat to that suggestion would be that a lot of people do bike on that trail um, and sometimes the, there's bikers that go through, but the trails are pretty wide. Um, and I see a lot of folks on there moving slow. Um, birders, you'll notice, are during spring, because we're busy looking for warblers, are moving pretty slow. Um, so we just kind of like ramble on really slowly looking for birds. Um, so if, if you're, um, a, whether it's you're a slow walker or you're in a wheelchair, um, the paved trails at Pheasant Branch Creek Corridor would be um, one spot that comes to mind. I also think that the, um, oh, that's a really good point, Gail. Um, I know that, so it's, um, Gail just put in the chat that since the flood of the Pheasant Branch Creek Corridor has some areas that are not presently paved. Um, so that's good to know. Um, I, there are some sections that are, but I, I don't know if I'd be able to tell you which ones um, are fully paved right now. Um, if folks are comfortable on, um, crushed limestone trails. Um, some another spot that you might consider would be the Lakeshore Nature Preserve. There's a trail that runs along University Bay um, that is um, kind of goes along the lake. There's nice wooded areas along the lake as you reach towards campus, um, and you can see a lot of birds along that stretch. Um, it's not paved, but it's a crushed limestone trail that's very flat. For waterfowl, um, if you're look, interested in looking at birds um, that are on the water, um, there is a really amazing um, kind of platform and, and boardwalk out at Lewis Park in McFarland. Um, and they just recently installed um, a, a scope system there. Um, and so there's two scopes um, that are set up on the platform um, that anyone can use. Um, the McFarland Bird Festival, I believe, raised money for that because they participated in last year's Birdathon. So what they did is they used their funds from the Birdathon to um, to buy those scopes and install them so everyone can use them. But that boardwalk um, has a is um, um, has has a nice even slope um, that it's fully wheelchair accessible. Um, so those are the spots that come to mind. I will also mention that there's a really great um, website called Birdability, um, where people can go and if they if they are out at a destination um, and want to submit a report to Birdability, they can upload basically all of the accessibility features that they saw or didn't see at one of those sites. Um, and so if you, if you're someone that's looking to explore areas that are um, accessible or what features they might have, you can look on the Birdability website and see um, what might be listed for those locations. Um, that said, Birdability relies on people reporting, reporting back on those locations and submitting them to the website. So that would be a really great um, place to look at to see what might be posted on the Madison area. I do know there's a couple of spots that have been mentioned on there, but um, for the rest of you listening um, and, and thinking about that, um, I would, encourage you to submit um, locations to BirdAbility um, so other people can learn about where to go. Um, Milo asked my, a question, oh, what's my favorite bird? Um, 
I have two favorite birds, um, and one of them is the green heron um, that we looked at earlier in the in the marsh bird section, um, and that's because um, of my first experience seeing them, they just really blew my mind. Um, we so the photo that we saw of of the green heron, um, it kind of had its head tucked in, um, but and they look just kind of like a like very round, almost like football shaped birds when they're like kind of up next to the reeds and they're sitting and they're waiting and they're watching for prey. But I, I saw one and I didn't I didn't think it really had a neck. I just thought it was kind of like, oh, that's just what shape it is. It's shaped like a football. And then then it went out and it just like shot out this super long neck that came out of nowhere to grab a frog um, that was along the edge of the water. And I realized that green herons have these like incredibly long necks that they're able to just like hide and just like poof, pop out whenever they need to grab something. And I just yeah. thought that was really funny. You should look at pictures of green herons to see mm -hmm. how, just how long their necks are. Um, and then my other favorite bird is a brown creeper, um, which is this tiny, very well camouflaged bird that creeps up the edge of tree bark as it spirals its way to the top of a tree. Um, I like them both because they are very, they can be kind of challenging to spot because they're so well camouflaged but they're also incredibly beautiful. And so when you see them, you're just completely wowed by them. That was a really great question. Does anyone else have any questions they wanna to toss out to the group before, um, before we wrap up tonight? Um, I just saw someone um, wave their hand, it was Heather? Oh, I, I put the question in the chat. Oh, uh, did at, I miss it? At the beginning of the chat, is it there? It's about oh yeah, my... I had to scroll up. I didn't scroll up far enough. Okay, so you have a nest on your patio that you left up from last year. This mor morning doves um, seem to have nested in it this year. Um, they've been in the nest every week for long periods. Today, a robin seems to be laying claim to the nest. Can the robin chase the morning doves away? And if there are eggs, will the robin destroy them? That's a really good question. I am not sure what is going to happen there. I don't know a ton about nesting birds, um, but I do know that it is very common for for uh, for morning bird morning birds for morning doves to kind of take over um, nests that they find abandoned. Um, I'm not sure what the robin is going to do about that though. I would be curious to to see who wins out in that situation. Um, does it seem like the robin has laid an egg in there already, or do you know if the morning doves already laid eggs? I would suspect that the morning dove has because the morning dove has been sitting um, long periods of time for okay. like the last five days. Okay, it's it is kind of a bit early for 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 nesting and for laying eggs though. So I'm wondering okay. if if they might just that could be just a territorial thing. Okay. Um, and so I don't know if I, either of those species will actually have laid anything, but okay. it is the time of year that, where they might start staking out their spot. Uh, so okay. you might find a little bit of a back and forth between whoever wants that nest, and I'm not sure who's going to win, um, okay. but that's an interesting question. I also, let's see, I see a couple of new messages. Um, are you posting the link to the presentation? Oh, yes. Oh, um, oh I saw that Liz did that. Um, so there's a PDF um, that you can access um, and download from the link in the chat. Um, it has a lot of photos in it, of course, because I shared a lot of pictures tonight. Um, so the file is a little big, but um, it, you should have access to all the slides tonight and all of the links um, that you can click on and to access those resources. Um, and where do we find that link? Um, you can find it in the chat box. And so if you are looking on your Zoom screen, um, there should be a button um, that says Ooh. chat. And then it says the PDF spring and summer. Spring and summer birding. Yep. And you, there should be a button below it says, that says download and you can click on it. Okay. Um, Michelle asked a question here. Should birders leave dogs at home if they are non-barkers? Um, and then mentioned that Lakeview Park in Middleton has woods and a lake with wide accessible paved trails for walking. Um, when it comes to, to dogs, um, I feel like there are, well, first of all, there are some conservation parks in town where you're not allowed to have dogs at all. 
Um, and so it's really important to be paying attention to what the rules are at a particular park um, when you're when you're out birding um, or even if you're just going for a walk because conservation parks like the Ch Cherokee Marsh um, and like Owen, Conser Owen Conservancy, like there's a lot of places um, where you can't have dogs because of nesting birds. Um, birds are really rely on those habitats and you don't want um, birds or dogs to be interfering or scaring the birds when they're trying to build their nests. Um, so first of all, you should check to see if dogs are allowed. But if you are at a place where dogs, where dogs are allowed and your dog is quiet, I know a lot of birders um, that do have dogs and we'll take them out at, at state parks in areas where they're allowed. And if their dogs are well behaved and not chasing off, off trail or, or, or chasing after birds, um, then I don't see that that's a problem as long as the rules of the park um, allow for that. And as long as dogs stay on leash. Um, anywhere you're at in Madison, if you're out a, at a park and dogs are allowed, they do have to be on leash. Um, so having off leash dogs in public spaces, um, especially when you have other people around that might be walking or hiking or birding um, and birds that might be at risk, um, they, um, the dog um, off leash dogs can cause some really big challenges there. So um, on leash dogs at places that are allowed, I don't think that it, that makes a huge deal um, that I don't think that's a huge deal when it comes to the amount of birds that you'll see. Um, let's see, a couple of people are commenting that they can't see the PDF. Um, and I am think I'm guessing that Liz should be able to hopefully email it to folks um, afterwards. Yep, or I can do. I'm, I'm just messaging people. If you want to send me your email address, um, I'm happy to just email that right out to you. Perfect. Thank you, Liz. And for those of you that can't see it, if you can try scrolling up in the chat, um, it was posted earlier. Um, and you might have to scroll to find it. I know we're at the, um, the we are a little bit after 730. Um, and so folks might be needing to leave. Um, anyone can feel free to pop out whenever, but I, if folks do have lingering questions and they want to ask something, um, now, now is the time. 